Part 4 A Future in Pixels The future for Dune on film was over, and the next year, in 1985, Frank Herbert would publish his final entry into the Dune saga. Chapter House Dune was the sixth book in the series, which would leave readers with a cliffhanger ending. Frank Herbert would get married for a third time to Teresa Shackelford in 1985. Then, in 1986, while recovering from surgery from pancreatic cancer, Frank Herbert passed away from a massive pulmonary embolism. Another tragic death would also hit the Herbert family, a few years after the passing of Frank Herbert, when in 1993 his son Bruce Herbert, a photographer and LGBT rights activist, would pass away from AIDS. Dino De Laurentiis Production Company had also gone into bankruptcy, and was purchased by Carlico Pictures in 1989. This combined with the death of Frank Herbert, the licensing rights for Dune got tied up in legal battles. The future of Dune, even in literary form, now seemed over. Any chance of another Dune film was gone. Dune as a franchise would stay dormant for the next seven years. However, Dune would get a second chance in a completely different medium, besides books or film, the video computer game. Martin Elper, the founder of Mastertronic, later renamed Virgin Interactive, was a fan of the Dune novel and saw potential in the story to be adapted into a video game. He had been trying to purchase the interactive rights from Universal Studios since 1989 and was finally successful in the spring of 1990. Remy Herbulot, a French programmer and one of the founders of Cryo Interactive Entertainment, met with Martin Elper and pitched several different games to him which were all heavily science fiction themed. Martin Elper then proposed Remy create a game based on Frank Herbert's Dune. Cryo Interactive Entertainment would then go on to develop an adventure strategy game based on Frank Herbert's Dune for Virgin Games, and in 1992 Dune the video game was released. Alongside the Dune game being released, Virgin Records also released the game's soundtrack, with the tracks composed by Stefan Peek and Philip Ulrich. The Dune game, unlike the Lynch film, was a commercial success, selling 20,000 copies in its first week and 300,000 copies by 1997. Dune for PC was not only a hit with gamers at the time, but critics as well, as it got a glowing review in the September 1992 issue Computer Gaming World by Maxwell Eaton. A tactical adventure, Dune unfolds in movie-like fashion with a level of character development that is satisfying. A slim manual provides basic information about the story and main players, plus a few tips. The vibrant colors and animated graphics which add depth and believability to the game scenario draw heavily on the stunning sets and costumes from David Lynch's 1984 film version of Dune. Later, in 1992, Virgin Games would release a second Dune game, named, appropriately enough, Dune 2 The Building of a Dynasty, developed by Westwood Studios, and would launch the real-time strategy genre, which Westwood would become famous for. Dune 2 would also become a commercial success and go on to sell 250,000 units by 1996, with some having the opinion that Dune 2 surpassed its predecessor, as seen here in the April 1993 issue of Computer Gaming World magazine in a review of Dune 2 by Alan L. Greenberg. In this sequel, which easily outshines its predecessor in terms of gameplay, three very desperate families vie for possession of the planet Arrakis, oft times known as Dune. In the background looms the despotic emperor of the known universe, an additional source of conflict. Dune 2 is a moderately difficult strategy war game, brought to life with what are arguably the most outstanding sounds and graphics ever to appear in a strategy game of its kind. In 2012, Time Tech did a list of 100 best video games of all time. Dune 2 was one of the games that made that list. Then, in August of 1998, Westwood Studios would release a second Dune game, called Dune 2000, which was an upgraded version of Dune 2, popular in its own right. Dune 2000 did not strike the same chord with fans or critics as Dune 2 did. 
a review of Dune 2000 by Greg Cassavant, would point out that Dune 2000 already looked dated by 1998 standards. There are two kinds of people, those who have played Dune 2 and those who haven't. Individuals comprising of the former category probably retain a fond memory of the game. These, then, are the people for whom Dune 2000 was created. It's a remake of the original. Designed to tug at the heartstrings, with its retouched graphics and sound, and same old gameplay, Dune 2 combined action and strategy in a famous science fiction setting back in 1993. The formula worked so well that it single-handedly gave rise to a wildly popular gaming genre, much like ID Software's Wolfenstein 3D defined the first-person shooter shortly beforehand. Yet, neither Dune 2 nor Wolfenstein withstand the test of time, since so many superior and similar games have emerged since then. For that reason, even those who enjoyed Dune 2 will find Westwood's remake disappointing, if not distressing. Dune 2000 would also be ported over to the PlayStation in October of 1999. In June of 2001, Westwood Studios would release its final game based on Frank Herbert's Dune. This game would be a sequel to the events of the previous game, Dune 2000. With the Emperor now dead, the Spacing Guild would put forth a challenge to three major houses, House Atreides, Harkonnen, and Ordos, a war of assassins on the planet Arrakis, with the winner becoming the new Emperor. This game would also feature cutscenes filmed with live actors, like the previous game Dune 2000 had done. It would star Michael Dorn, best known for his character of Worf on Star Trek The Next Generation. He would play Duke Achilles Atreides. Emperor, Battle for Dune would miss the bullseye even further with critics, like Dune 2000. Jason Kapalka reviewed the game in the September 2001 issue of Computer Gaming World magazine. First, the good news. Compared with Dune 2000, Westwood's last journey to the desert world of Arrakis, Emperor, Battle for Dune is a blinkin' masterpiece. But given that Dune 2000 was an ultra-cheap retread of Command & Conquer, that's faint praise indeed. And here's the bad news. While Emperor does finally bring the Command & Conquer franchise into the brave new world of full 3D only a couple of years after Total Annihilation, Warzone 2100, Homeworld, and Ground Control pioneered the territory in every other respect, it's a throwback, rife with baffling design decisions, clunky AI, and uninspired units. Westwood Studios would never duplicate the success of Dune 2 with another Dune game. There would be one more Dune game released in November of 2001, and that would be Frank Herbert's Dune by Cryo Interactive. Where their first Dune game released in 1992 was a hit, this game would be a costly flop with both critics and fans already having financial difficulties at this point. Cryo Interactive would go under. A PlayStation 2 version of this game would be released, but only in Europe. As a side note, Dune fans could also enjoy adventures on Arrakis with the release of the card game Dune Eye of the Storm in 1997. Having only ever played Dune 2000 and Emperor Battle for Dune myself, I can't speak about the other games. However, Dune 2000 is one of my all-time favorite games. I played the game to death, but Emperor Battle for Dune did not recapture that magic for me. Initially, I was excited for the game, but after spending some time playing the game, I quickly lost interest without completing it. It seemed that Dune's second life it found with gamers had run its course. It may have been the end of Dune in video games, but not the end of the Dune franchise. Not by a long shot. Thank you to all of my subscribers, and thank you for watching this video. And if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, and share. And don't forget to hit the bell icon for notification when new videos are uploaded.